Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey Healing. I'm John Mueller. This is the leader in internet TV. This is TECN.TV. And uh, we're here every Friday night on Journey to Healing from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I want to wish you all a happy Father's Day for those of you that it is applicable to. Um, I am looking for, I may have my intro here. Yes, yeah, sorry about that, a little tech issues. Um, on Father's Day, similar to Mother's Day, it can be bittersweet, depending upon who you are and what you've been through and what the constellation or composition of your family. We're going to take a little bit of time to uh, go through memory lane as far as those of you that have an intact family, those of you that have fond feelings for Father's Day or of Father's Day. But what about those of you who may not have the fondest of feelings are not really looking forward to Father's Day as a father. Well, we're going to look at the various aspects of what may contribute to that. And we'll look at that next on this edition of Journey to Healing. Welcome to Journey to Healing. Do you find yourself discouraged, troubled, in need of healing, but not sure where to turn? John Euler, a licensed professional counselor, is here to help. John has more than 30 years of professional experience, helping people deal with the issues that keep them emotionally and spiritually stuck. There is help. There really is hope. There is a God who loves you, who wants to help you find peace and strength. And John Euler is here to help you find that on this edition of Journey to Healing. Welcome back, everyone. My name is John Euler, and again, this is Journey to Healing. We're doing a deep dive into the topic of forgiveness, what it is versus what it is not. But in the midst of that, we have Father's Day. And it's actually going to kind of piggyback on what we've been talking about. We have been uh, studying the life of Joseph or how things turned out, Joseph being the the last 26% of the book of Genesis, he was number 11 of 12 boys, and he had brothers who did heinous things to him, eventually sold him into slavery, then it went from bad to worse, uh, falsely accused, he winds up in prison, but God helps him get out of that situation and puts him in a position, really the number two position in Egypt. And so we've been looking at what... Uh, what are the implications for a family when it has to do with reunification? If um, there is evidence of contrition, what does that look like? And to what extent will that family ever uh, be together again? And does God expect us to be together as a family? We've been looking at that, but for Father's Day, I wanted to, um, for those of you that experience positive feelings on Father's Day, I thought I would add some encouragement. And that is currently found on churchprotect.org. Let me tell you where you can find that. If you go to the Insights tab, which should be right, one, two, three, there it is, right there. And this being June, I have had an opportunity to go through family photos and even emails and texts, just kind of going back through um, going kind of through memory lane. And I thought it might be helpful to um, to read some of those. And I'm looking at my screen. It's not entirely cooperating. So what I'm going to do, even as we are talking, I'm going to be bringing up the other screen here from my other computer, because apparently there's tech issues. The reason I thought about doing this was, you know, families can be a funny thing. We parents, ideally, you know, nobody's perfect, but ideally we um, we put our um, efforts, our time, effort, energies, and resources into doing the best we can. Now, when we are wrong, and we've looked at that this time and time again, when we have done something wrong, what uh, what should be the response? Well, it should be that we seek to make amends. And that is something that is really um, a non-negotiable. We need to be able to try to make amends when possible. What does that look like? We confess, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
And, you know, rather than me trying to interpret these, I'll kind of give you a summary of what you'll find. Again, um, hopefully it's helpful. I have what's called um, different tips or um, encouragement for Father's Day, and I'm looking at uh, this, and it's the browser is not moving. So I will just kind of give you a summary of what you'll find on there. These are different little thumbnail uh, photos, as were, or photos with brief uh, little thoughts. So I thought I would encourage uh, dads. I am a dad of three grown kids now, one daughter and two boys, and thought I would uh, share little bits of encouragement. I have different things that I have found and found effective as far as helping bonding, helping the kids feel safe and secure. Usually that is done through how? Spending time in a um, casual way with the kids, helping them sense your heart, sense your character. What should our character be? It's really found in Galatians chapter 5. We have the fruits of the Spirit. So it says that uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Where do you find love? That's really out of 1 Corinthians 13. Love, uh, that is sacrificial love. That is putting another person first. So dads, let me ask you this. We'll kind of focus on dads here. Dads, how are you when it comes to love, tangibly? I'll give you some practical questions. When it comes to food time, when it comes to eating, uh, do you go first? Do you um, ensure that you get satisfied first, that your, uh, your tastes are what uh, calls the order, so to speak, meaning is what you want or do you take an egalitarian perspective, a democratic perspective with that? Um, let's say there are, let's say you're a family of four and there are six pieces of chicken or two left. What are you going to do? Well, if you're a loving dad, you are going to sacrifice, aren't you? You're going to certainly serve your wife first. And then you're going to do what you can to divvy up the rest of the meat among your kids. So dad is going to put himself last. Now, should dad always put himself last? I want to say typically. Now, again, we can run the risk of uh, enabling or rescuing our kids. We can end up becoming so parent-centered, or I should say kid-centered. Let me rephrase that, right? That... I can become so worried about how my kids feel that without knowing it, I begin to enable them. Uh, we begin to try to make life okay for them above and beyond uh, so that they don't experience any pain. And uh, probably I'm guilty of that over the years, right? Meaning uh, the kids fall down and have a little scrape. And what do you do? I, I would, you know, I was told I would tend to go overboard a little bit, but I'd rather my kids see that dad really cared. Um, how about if you could tell there was tension in the home? Will you stop everything and address it? A dysfunctional home is what? It is one that is tension reducing, but never tension resolving. How many dads tune out, put the TV on, uh, go lock themselves away somewhere in their man cave, put their headphones on and just tune out? Then how about this? Um, so uh, for the spirit is love. Do your kids know that they matter by do you place their interests and their int yeah their interests um, certainly needs but interests above your own? How about the things they enjoy? Life is busy, and we only have so much time in the day. So let's say Friday night comes along. You've had a hard day. Well. You might enjoy a certain genre of movies. Let's say you're into historical movies or you're, you like war movies, I'm talking to dads here, or whatever it is, sports or whatever it is. Now, your kids may be into sports, but if your kids have certain movies that they really love to watch, my kids used to love some of the animated films such as Over the Hedge, uh, Tangled, Despicable Me. That was, a, that was a really fun one, by the way. Okay, um, just, I, I, there were so many that we watched. Okay, so you have your choice. You only have a limited amount of time. It's Friday night, and the kids want to watch a movie with you. What do you do? 
do you let them pick out the movie or do you say, no, 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 it's dad's turn or it's dad, it's my time. And so you put on what you want to watch. I once heard of a dad who had the king's chair. Matter of fact, dad, do you have a certain chair that all the kids know? No, 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 that's dad's chair. Well, then I want to politely suggest you get over that. You dethrone yourself and you let the kids sit wherever they want. Do you ever wrestle for control of the remote control? You need to stop that. Okay, the kids need to be able to see a dad who is selfless. So dads, what I recommend is this. Uh, you enjoy what your kids want to watch because kids love making sure that dad is into it, right? They love curling up, curling up next to you. As a matter of fact, I put a couple of pictures up the, uh, on, the, um, on my site. And it was nice to be able to go back and reminisce. And you can see my daughter. She likes being close to me. And so you can see the relaxed look on her face. As a matter of fact, uh, another thing I did with my kids, I played board games. Dads, we have lost the art. We've lost the art of spending time with our kids. Board games are a neat way to connect. In this day and age, what are we all doing? We're all separate. We we're on the computer. We're on our phones. You look at the typical family when they go out to eat and what's going on. Everybody's just staring. Right? Staring at what? Staring at their cell phone. That's what they're staring at. Nobody's talking. You almost wonder if somebody should text everybody in a group text saying, hello, anybody? <laughs> Maybe they're texting, what do you want to eat? Okay, how about unplugging? Dad, I will ask that you, I want to make a challenge, right? Lead by example. That's what uh, selflessness is. Love is selfless, by the way. So dads, let's step up and lead by example. In what way, for instance? letting the kids see how sacrificial you are and that you don't do it begrudgingly. Dad, do not sit there and roll your eyes kind of like, well, okay, we'll watch what you want to watch. What's that about? Don't do that. Make them feel special, right? And it's a lot of fun to laugh with your kids. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the times we were watching a movie and uh, my kids turned to me and they said, Dad, you're, you're so funny. And I said, what? You always slap your knee when you're laughing really hard. Well, that's a neat thing, right? That was a nice little thing uh, between myself and my kids that only they would know. Um, playing a board game, I recommend. And here's one of the posts. I have one of me with my two boys. And Nicole was certainly, Nicole would play too, but it, this is a word game. Now, let me define that. It's a board game. It's a strategy game. And it's a, it, a very true to life or true to the historical account. It's account. It's called Axis and Allies. Now there's um, electronic versions, and that's probably kind of fun, but that's not the purpose. Remember, what we want to do is this. We want to be able to spend time and exchange uh, times of laughter and, and talking. If dads are willing to spend time, and here's a, a little uh, example of how you can spend time. For girls, Dad, if you have a daughter, women, generally speaking, bond face-to-face, -face, meaning talking. Okay, that's why um, most women understand when they say, let's, let's do coffee. As a matter of fact, um, if you remember, if you went to a co-ed co college dorm, if you'd ever looked into his walking by, if you ever look at uh, the uh, young ladies, right, the, the college students, females, in their dorm room, it's not uncommon to find two girls almost knee-to-knee -knee in Indian style as they're sitting, and they're talking. Do you ever see guys doing it? <laughs> no, we guys don't do that. Maybe some guys do that. I, I wouldn't know what to do with that. Okay. But guys, so dads, this is important with your sons. Guys bond shoulder to shoulder. So we bond through doing activities. So those of you that are dads that are mechanical, I'm a little jealous. My dad was not mechanical. But here's the thing. He didn't try to teach me anything. Okay, He was an attorney by trade. And so I saw what it meant to spend long hours um, at a desk. 
But other than that, um, I really never saw him pick up a tool. I never saw him. We, we had a broken window in our front window. Now that I'm thinking about this, I was mowing the lawn one time. We had a gravel driveway and a little rock flipped up and it cracked. Put almost like a little BB hole in a bathroom window. It turned out eventually to be my room with my bathroom. Do you know that, that stayed like that? I think about it. that window had a little crack. Now this is in Sacramento, so it didn't get too too cold. Um, but that window stayed like that for forty years. All right? What's that about? So there's a good example as well. Uh, since love is patient, love is kind. I'm thinking First Corinthians thirteen, by the way. The word kind in the Greek means useful. So that's going to be another thing we're going to talk about. So let's still go back to love. How do we love our kids? So I recommend with boys, you do an activity together. And here's also what's important. Oh, self-esteem for kids. Uh, we have a crisis of self-esteem in this day and age. The entire trans movement is predicated upon kids not knowing who they are. To the point that somebody can tell them they're born in the wrong body. Okay, we don't say, well, the, I used to believe that was my male dog and a female dog, but I think I'm confused. Maybe my dog was born in the wrong body. No, and veterinarians aren't confused either. Okay, so this entire trans movement, for instance, comes from kids with self esteem issues. It used to be in the field of mental health that how you would help a kid with low self esteem is to eventually figure out what they are good at. Self-esteem comes from being accepted by, ideally, those closest to you, but ultimately a sense of competence, that you're good at something. You find out what your natural talents, abilities, and gifts are. Ideally, you can make a living at that, but if not, you still know what you're good at. So you know that you know your place in the world, meaning you're special, you were given gifts. But a kid that has not gained a sense of competence probably did not have parents that spent much time with them, helping them understand the world, helping them understand themselves, helping them understand what they were good at. And then they probably weren't affirmed in the right way. How about this? Attaboy. How about you can do it? I remember walking by my room, you know, the, the master bedroom, and my youngest was, he was probably two, maybe three at the time, um, but he was putting together a puzzle. And, you know, it, big enough for his dexterity, but he's putting together a little jigsaw puzzle. And as I'm walking down the hall, I'm hearing this little voice, um, and it's coming out of from the doorway. And he's talking to somebody. Well, I slow down and I look, he's talking to himself. He has self-talk going on. We all do that, by the way, right? Whether out loud or not. And guess what he was doing? He was repeating this phrase. It's okay. You can do it. You could do it. <laughs> and that was cute. That was positive affirmation that he received, but it was also positive affirmation that he heard me do that. And so I helped implant that script in him. And that was nice, right? We may not do everything right, but it's nice when we see those kind of indicators. Uh, when our, uh, let me go back to again, spending time. Dads, again, limited amount of time. We probably have a limited budget, most of us do. How much does it cost to throw a ball around? Do your kids know how to kick a ball? Do your kids know how to throw and catch? Dad, they're not going to, it's not magic, meaning they're not going to get that through osmosis. I'm not all that good at basketball. Okay, uh, why? Well, my dad never played basketball. I don't even know if we owned a basketball. Okay, and yeah, I've gotten through life without playing basketball. Okay, but it's kind of sad now that I think about it. Uh, although I think I was on junior high basketball. Team, but guess who I had to learn from? I had to learn from the other kids and, and had to learn from the coach. How about this? Dads, do you show up? Do you show up to practice? Do you show up to their events, their meets, 
their athletic activities, their presentations, or is there an empty seat? Now, I understand we're tired. There are many, most of my life I had worked two jobs, right? Uh, I wanted their mother to be able to stay home. But because of that, we didn't really have a chance to ever afford a home. So I understand what it's like to live on a very limited income. For the majority of my life, I ate peanut, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Why? It's just what you do. But I made sure that I was there for my kids' activities. Now, for those of you dads that um, your situation is you haven't been able to be in the lives of your kids and you wanted to, you know, there's the key, and you wanted to. There's a lot of different family constellations out there. As I'm going through this list, and this is actually off the cuff, um, but again, I recommend go to churchprotect.org under the Insights tab and drop down to this month, and you will find a number of little uh, uh, ideas that I give dads. To the extent that we are able to, and our kids will tend to understand, right, if we actually can't help it, but they need to see that we are putting forth serious effort. Okay? But the more a kid looks out and sees an empty seat on the bleachers uh, in the audience, you know they know that. How about this? Do I show up to their practices if I can? If you are married and your spouse is there, how about, Dad, you take the kids to their practice? How about you take them on Saturday to their events? Um, I made it a habit on Saturday, even though I was exhausted. That was my only day to sleep in. What did I do? I got up and I took my daughter to horseback um, riding. She was involved, and this is in the activity, by the way. She was involved in uh, volunteering for what's called therapeutic riding for uh, special needs kids. But through that, she was also allowed to get free horseback riding lessons. And so she did that for years. And the, um, the organization would tend to move uh, stables. So I think we went through four or five different stables. But I forget how young she was. She could barely get on the stirrups, so to speak. But then eventually she was able to be a side walker. And that was really neat. And then she was able to get into horses, and then she actually rode in some competitions. Well, I can tell you as a non-horse person, um, you know, did I, could I have made the excuse that I got better things to do with my time and football is on and I'll say, yeah, well, I'm tired. So could I have, could I have found a lot of excuses? How about this? Could I have dropped her off and then done what I want to do and then come back? Yeah, but I didn't. Why? Because she needs to know you're there. And plus, what happens if something happens? But the kids need, there's something about knowing that dad is on the premises, dad is there, that he cares enough, he's prioritized. How about track? My youngest did track. And I took him to practices every day after I got home, took him to practice. And um, then I, there would be a, a number of times where I would drop him off now lest I contradict myself, I then had to go and help their mother with errands, and then I would come back But for every meet. But I made it back in time, and I would go out a number of times and sit in the stands, sit in the bleachers. But for the meets, especially all the home ones, Dad, have we been there? Yeah. Are there pictures to prove it? Now, why do I say that? Because our kids need those pictures. And am I a passive observer or am I an active observer? There's an important thing because that's how we show love. When the kids look up, to kind of, they glance up and see, uh, do they see me down looking at my phone or do they know I'm actually watching them? They need to see that we're engaged because if I'm not engaged, in a way, why am I there? Now, it's good that we're there, but dads, we need to be involved. How about if um, your son or daughter ran cross country? My youngest uh, did cross country a couple of seasons. And just shy of embarrassing him, that was not my purpose, but I have to admit, I'm rooting for him. And I remember uh, he, they're doing cross country at a certain school, and 
uh, we parents were notified where the uh, course went. And the course came by the school a couple of times, and then the last part, the last lap, the last leg, was going to be running the perimeter of this school, and the school um, was bordering, was bordered by woods. And so it kind of weaved in and out. Well, I remember, you know, the, the little uh, starting gun goes off. There must have been 250 kids. This was a uh, invitational meeting. We have all these kids from all these schools and we all stand out of the way. And bless his heart, my son's running as hard as he, he did a wonderful job. So off they go. Well, I'm rooting him. But then I know where um, the best vantage point for the closest spot. So what do I do? Now, I could have stayed at the finish line. I probably would have been an average dad, probably better than average dad, and isn't that sad? But what did I do? I wanted to hear because I was the only one there for him at that meet. So I wanted to, I wanted to root him on. So I, I go running across campus <laughs> to the one spot that the one turn, they're going to kind of come in and then off they go again. The, the trail goes all over. And I was there, I was rooting him on, taking pictures. And then Remember, it's going to kind of weave in and out. Now, this was in Pennsylvania. So some of the schools are rural. So their track can kind of get close to the a part of the legs of the track, get close to the school, and then they go off in the woods and over hill and dale and all that. But then they come back. So there were a couple of times where I'm running across campus. I was a little out of shape at that time, but running across campus. Why? So I could be there so he could hear my voice rooting him on. And then the last leg... I actually was sort of running along with him, saying he could do it. I do think he appreciated that. I don't think I embarrassed him. But you know what? So our kids need those attaboys. Those kids, they don't need our criticism. Okay, I've heard of too many situations where kids are in basketball or they're in some sort of sport, and what do they hear from their parents? Right? They, they start hearing a litany of criticism or, quote, unquote, helpful critique. Dad, that's not your job. Okay, your job is to be their cheerleader and let them know they can do it. Because what kid isn't giving it their best effort? I don't know very many, unless the kid is discouraged, and that's a different thing. Every now and then you might have a kid that's a screw off. Well, then you know what? Get him off the team. Okay, well, let's get back to board games. So I recommend um, Axis and Allies for boys and girls too. I'm not going to be sexist with that, but it, it's kind of, it's very much war. It's World War II. Great game, teaches kids history, teaching them finances, teaches them all about what goes into the minds of generals as, for instance, General Eisenhower during D-Day. How do you plan for them? It really gives them a sense of tactics. It's like four-dimensional chess, so that's a really neat game. And it has little pieces, so you feel like you're, you're in the war room, so to speak. Now, girls. Uh, girls will tend to like card games. They tend to like the game of life. Why? Because they like the little pegs and they get a bunch of kids and they can sell them off at the end. <laughs> okay. But they, they, sorry, some of you remember that, right? A little spin. And um, and then you have to decide between college or um, a life's, uh, you know, being a trade, as it were. And dads, be careful, right? Let's say you want your kids to go to college. That would be an easy time to drop a hint. Oh, no, no. Do you know what your earning potential is going to be? <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. Okay. Um, girls also love, how about shoots and ladders? Remember that? Or the, right. That's a fun one. Oh, you know, if you have to go back to start, um, or cheesy is another one. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if they tag you or whatever, and you have to go back, oh, you go down the slide or, um, you know, part cheesy is one. Remember Carol Burnett on her program, they play, uh, or sorry. Okay. That's one. Part cheesy is another one. But sorry, what happens when they land on you? Oh, sorry, ring the little bell and you have to go back. Okay, Dad, I'll give you a hint about board games with your kids. The goal is not to win. And by the way, if you own the game of Monopoly, I'm biased, get rid of it. Okay, no good thing, thing comes from Monopoly. Why? It's godless capitalism and everybody, it's what, dog eat dog and only one person's going to feel satisfied and everybody's going to walk away upset. Just get rid of the game of Monopoly. That's a psychopath's favorite game. Don't teach your kids to be psychopath. Ha ha, oh, you have to go to the poorhouse. Oh, okay, what, you're going to foreclose on them? That has, that's not how you treat the poor, okay? You want to give them sort of God's perspective. 
Okay, and card games. Uh, kids uh, love card games. Girls love card games. Again, I'm not being sexist, but whatever your kids want to play. How about uh, Chinese checkers? Okay, how about chess? These are great games. If you don't know how, if they know, uh, if you don't know how, then learn. Okay, but here's the deal. If you, if you can beat them, okay, then don't necessarily beat them right away, but challenge them. Help them up their skill. But the goal is not to beat them as quickly as it's possible so you can get on with it or derive a sense of satisfaction that you trumped your seven-year-old. That's not the goal. The goal is to have fun. So the question is, when you look through your pictures, your family pictures, now I'm kind of looking through them in retrospect, what do you see? What do you see on the faces of your kids? Right? If your kid is troubled, if your child is troubled, emotionally troubled, it may very well be that what happened. They ended up not having a good self-esteem. So what happened? So here's what you want to look for to kind of have a barometer. Okay, Dad, how well am I doing? Well, get some of the pictures that you've taken of your kids before and look at their body language in the photo. Look at their face. Do you see joy? Well, what do you look for? The natural ability to smile. A wounded spirit, a child with a wounded spirit, will have a staged or kind of, well, staged smile, a pressured smile. Who can do? Right, uh, not a lot of movement in their eye, uh, in their forehead, and it looks almost like a mannequin. It looks like they're kind of lifeless, but they'll smile out of obligation. But their posture will be closed; it won't be open. Uh, their eyes will be sunken or sullen or dark, as it were, meaning you you won't see um, brightness. You won't see a little gleam in their eyes. So that's what you want to look for. So when we look through our pictures, those of you with that are dads right now, what are you seeing when you take pictures of your kids? If you haven't taken pictures of your kids a while, then guess in a while, then guess what? You need to. Uh, uh, we've only gotten through um, love is uh, as far as the fruit of the spirit, huh? The fruit of the spirit is love. We've just looked at love. I'll quickly, and then we'll take a little bit of a break. Uh, so in uh, Galatians chapter 5, it said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now, what is joy? Joy is not happiness, though it certainly can connote happiness. But the, the true meaning of the word joy is stability under uh, when, when life is being brought to bear. You're able to be stable. And that typically is only possible if you have a rock that is stronger than you. So when your kids saw you under pressure, did they see you cut and run? Did they see you say, well, you know what? Uh, I just, I'm going to do me. Did you give yourself the option to start drinking? Did you give yourself the option to start hanging out with your friends? Okay. That is not what joy is all about. Teach your kids that dis, uh, despite what's going on as best you can. Now, there are times that are amazing tire, uh, pressure cooker situations, especially if you are on the receiving end of white collar psychopaths. Okay. Um, it's, it's hard to have a smile on your face at that time. But, uh, kids need to see us being real. But for instance, if you are being attacked for standing up for the right thing, for taking a stand, for speaking truth. And now you're being targeted by family, by friends, by uh, your place of work, by your organization. If you're being slandered, what do your kids see you doing at that point? Do you come unraveled and uh, go to the bar, take out you know, a bottle of alcohol and start drinking? Or do they see you take your Bible out? Do you have a Bible? If you have a Bible, and this is, I just want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, the question is, um, how could your kids tell that you have been in your Bible? Is it well used? Because that is the source of stability. Psalm 91.1 says, He who dwells under the shadow of the Almighty 
will remain stable and fixed. Do your kids ever see that under stress, that they look out or they find you, they see dad um, alone with his Bible? That's very important. That's how you help them understand where that source of stability is. So going back to Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay. Do you have peace on the inside? Again, that's usually when all hell is breaking loose. Right? This usually means things are not going all that well, but though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, meaning the deepest and darkest of valleys, do your kids see you come apart at the seams, or do they see that you're evidencing that even though they see pain on your face, that they know that the captain is still at the helm? So they can also know that, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I know that dad will never abandon ship. How about patience? The word patience is hupomene. That means to remain under. Very similar. What does that mean? Emotional bench press. When it's getting too much and your arms are starting to shake, meaning you're feeling it close in on you, you're feeling like you're losing control, do you say screw it and uh, drop the weights and get off the bench? Or do you remain under patient endurance, which allows God to do character training in you? Now, during these times, if we evidence that we've allowed our emotions to get the best of us and we become emotionally reactive, what do we do? We need to acknowledge it to our kids. And then we need to spend time along with the Heavenly Father so that we can give him our burden, so we can cast our cares upon him, so we can feel that he cares about us. How about kindness? Again, kindness means useful. Dads, are you, are you useful? Again, this has to do with how you bond with your kids as well. For instance, are you issuing edicts, or are you in there along with your kids? Is there a job that is out of bounds for you? Or are you willing to do any job? Do your kids see you taking out the trash? Do your kids see you helping with the groceries? Dad, you should be up and out to the car if, you, if their mother, if your spouse is, uh, went, was good enough to go grocery shopping. Your kids should see you model. Do they see you opening the door for their mother? The, these should be just natural things, and they will then understand what it means to be uh, to see a man who is modeling selflessness, and they will also derive a sense of security with that. Let me also uh, share a couple of fun things. I just remember <laughs> a couple of fun things. Uh, kids love to swing. Uh, I was able to put up uh, really what amounted to a small tree fort. I took logs and took big spikes. It was a big willow tree. And the logs then became the steps. And I attached a rope swing, but it had a disc seat. So the kids were able to... And then I put planks that were Trex planks, plastic, so they wouldn't get uh, splinters. Made a little seat up there. They could go and read up there. Um, I also had a cement fort for them, kind of unusual. Our patio used to be... The place that we rented used to be a garage, and they'd taken all the cinder blocks and made a huge pile. And trust me, it was just a random pile but I rearranged that, had to take them all out, and I made a fort with stairs. So for those of us that may be on or have been on a tight budget, there are things that we can do. But here's some other things, um, and also being there for firsts. Dad, who taught your kids to walk? Hopefully, if you could have been there, you did. How about swinging? Did you take them apart and help them swing? I remember that, that was fun. Um, just take them to parks and throw the ball around. How about bike riding? Did you teach your kids how to ride a bike? How about tying their shoes? Were you in there? How about learning to read? Now, that's hopefully a joint effort with a number of people, but are you willing and able to take time to, do you know where your child is at in terms of, are they at grade level? And if they're not, especially in elementary school, turn off the TV and help them. You be their tutor. And if you don't know, then find a video. You know, if you're not good at math and the kid's getting into algebra, you know what? Let's sit down together with them. Okay. How about exercise, by the way, and health and nutrition? Um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I, I had a couple um, uh, posts I did about that. Dad, are you leading by example? Uh, do your kids see that you exercise? Are your kids uh, seeing dad being healthy, trying to take care of his temple? 
Um, or are you eating junk food? How about being responsible with money? Do they see that you're on a budget? Do they know the budget? So money management, those will be very practical things. Those are ways you can help your kids feel secure. Um, again, as you look at those pictures, do you see an openness of spirit or are they closed? Do they look at the camera? Do you see a little twinkle in their eyes or do you see they're kind of empty in there as far as uh, a wounded spirit? Those are some of the ways that we can build into our kids. And hopefully those are helpful. Again, churchprotect.org under the Insights tab this month, which would be June 2024. I have a number of other uh, hopefully practical and helpful suggestions. When we come back, I'm going to be talking to dads who may not have one or more kids in their life, that somehow something went wrong. And we're going to hopefully be able to encourage you because there are a lot of stories, historical accounts of dads that were reasonable, dads that were good, that ended up with kids that run, ran the gamut as far as being everything from irresponsible to extremely heinous. And trust me, it ruined Father's Day. So we're going to look at that on the other side of the break. Are you or someone you know a survivor of abuse? and wondering where to turn for trustworthy help and insights into the effects of such abuse? Ever wish you had access to a resource that could help you continue your progress in your healing? SurvivorSupport.net is that resource. It is a one-of-a-kind resource developed by John Euler, a seasoned therapist with over three decades of experience working with sexual abuse survivors to help survivors with the process of healing. It can also help you understand the nature of those who harmed you so you can gain clarity and continue healing. If you are interested in speaking with John Euler about your situation or having John conduct a consultation or a training for your church or organization, SurvivorSupport.net serves as a convenient method of contacting him. Our weekly program, Journey to Healing, is made possible through the generous donations of viewers like you. There are many opportunities and needs that Survivor Support is attempting to meet. So your monthly support or a one-time gift would be extremely helpful as we seek to meet those needs and opportunities. Simply visit SurvivorSupport.net and you will see the link to donate on the homepage. We thank you. Welcome back, everyone. My name is John Euler. This is Journey to Healing. We're here every Friday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on TECN.TV, the leader in Internet TV. We are addressing the topic of Father's Day. We looked at and provided hopefully some helpful hints, some helpful little suggestions on how to how fathers can enhance their relationship with their kids, can help them ensure or help ensure that their kids are well adjusted, that they have good self esteem, that they feel safe and secure, and what indicators to look for. Again, the thing ultimately you look for is posture and facial expression. Are they open or are they closed? And if you look at pictures, do you see them smiling naturally? spontaneously? Do they have funny little goofy on uh, some of the pictures, right? Because not all of them are going to be formal pictures. So in their various pictures, do you see a kid that is uh, appearing natural and actually enjoying themselves? Or do you see a kid that is um, very stiff and uh, just unnatural, as it were? So dads, kind of review the pictures you have, and that'll kind of give you an indication of how you're doing or actually how you did. For those dads, that are finding or have found that you don't look forward to Father's Day. Maybe Father's Day, maybe you couldn't be there with your kids. Or how about if you raised your kids and there was all indication that everything was fine, even up until a couple of years ago when you launched them and they seemed to be doing fine, but maybe you had to begin to implement boundaries. Maybe you had and you started to see things you'd never seen out of your young adults. Right? they got to make their own way, but let's say they started to have trouble, or you thought, trouble launching, and so they had a couple of um, maybe some failed starts, and so you're helping them financially, and now you're just seeing this pattern, and before you know it, maybe you co-signed for a loan for a car. Well, you did that. Why? So that your, your child, your adult child could afford a car. They couldn't do it otherwise. Maybe you weren't in a position to buy a new car for them, but maybe you even gave them your best car. Why? Because you wanted them to have a reliable car. You wanted to 
show them how much you cared. And then all of a sudden, when they crossed certain lines and you had to confront them or you had to set boundaries saying, no, whoa, whoa, hold on. This isn't, we can't, we're not going to do this. All of a sudden they morph and they morph into a kid you don't even recognize anymore. The question is, what do you make of that? And is that reflective of your parenting? Well, we always need to be able and willing to reevaluate. But it's important to know that biblically, there's a really good balance found in Scripture, that God places responsibility on parents and a lot of responsibility on dads for the tone of the home. Okay, We are the captain of the ship. We need to make sure that we're leading by example. But if we have done our part, if we do our part, and nobody's perfect, so we make amends, we provide fruits of repentance that match. But if our kids, for whatever reason, have either evidenced issues of character, so character problems that we didn't see, because it also could be that maybe we rescued and enabled our kids and we didn't see that. So along with maybe there was other issues going on, maybe there's a little bit of self-entitlement growing. And that's something we need to be mindful of. If we, right? we need to watch for that and then put boundaries up. But let's say um, you have kids and for whatever reason, Father's Day now isn't going as you had planned. Again, what do we do about that? What do we make of that? Well, the first thing is we have to be, we have to have an understanding of how God views uh, relationships, especially with kids, and the response where he places responsibility. He places responsibility on each person. Each person should own one knapsack, no more, no less. And everybody is going to own their own stuff, and God will re require accountability from parents and children, but especially adult children. Yes, the sins of the fathers will be passed along to the third and fourth generation. What does that mean? Dysfunction rolls downhill. Okay, so each of us, we're not responsible for what we're given, but we're responsible for what we do with it. So the buck has to stop here. So I'm not given a pass, but doing the best we can. If all of a sudden we start to see stuff come out of our kids that now changes everything, should we naturally assume that we missed it or we blew it? Not necessarily. We should probably take a biblical perspective, which is God holds people accountable. And people can become selfish. People can even become narcissistic. And dads, it is true. Right? Our kids, right? And what do we then do? Well, it's equal opportunity. If you've been with us for any length of time, you've heard us talking about uh, pigs and dogs in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, 6. The word pigs is referenced to within the family. Is it possible to have a family member become a pig? Absolutely it is. Was that a parent? A parent could be a pig. How about a kid? Anybody. So we, we left off as we were looking at the story of Joseph. We looked at the indicators because of his brothers. What are some of the indicators of narcissism? Narcissism. Well, I uh, read some of these. Let me review it again. Uh, a narcissist plays upon the sympathy, sympathies of others. Uh, to manipulate people into rescuing them despite having contributed to the issue. Okay, thus toying with their emotions and playing people for fools. So, uh, have you evidenced, have you seen evidence that your child, your adult child, can begin to lie with finesse, uh, right to people's faces, even maybe in writing, sometimes even on social media? What do you do if you see that your adult child? says, I've been in a certain career for 15 years, but they're only age three. Okay, that's an issue. I, I didn't start a career at age 15. Okay, uh, there will be other telltale, oh, financially draining someone with little care of impact. If you have a child that has become selfish, an adult child, right, they're going to play, play you. We need to be mindful of that. There will be other telltale signs of those who become little perpetrators, meaning oppressors, willful deception, calculated manipulation, strategic tactics employed to emotionally harm someone. And if you draw boundaries, 
they could set out to emotionally harm their own parents. Financial deception, using money deceptively, manipulating someone to co-sign a loan, and then failing to pay. Well, dads, what if you have an adult child on your hands that um, maybe is not exactly acting like you would thought they would act, and therefore Father's Day is not what you had hoped? Let's say it's going to be a different Father's Day, or let's say it has been for 10 years now. I was just dealing with a client who, uh, their kid, when they were a senior, just there were some things, got involved pretty much with a um, cult leader and uh, a female and was seduced. And before you know it, the parents were the worst thing since sliced bread. And so they suffer because of this. Well, take heart in realizing that God places responsibility on all adults, even young adults, for their attitudes, their disposition, and their behavior. We're not responsible for what we're given, but we are for what we do with it. That goes for parents and children alike. The important thing to remember is that you'll never read of a perfect parent in the Bible. In fact, the only perfect parent was God himself. And the very first two kids he had, what, rebelled against him, went their own way, blamed him for their decision. Remember what Adam said? It's the woman you gave me. That's the emphasis in the Greek, by the way, or in the Hebrew. The woman um, that you gave me. I would have been fine if you hadn't. And those kids, those adult children, lost out on what they could have had. But God remained stable. The key issue in any relationship is grace and truth. Where there has been human failings or wrongs, we're to acknowledge our wrongs directly to the person with proof of a broken and contrite spirit with, with fruits of repentance and seek to make them whole and add extra to the extent that they have been impacted by our choices and actions. So if there has been something you did, have you tried to make up for it? Try to make it up to them. If they are at a disadvantage, are you willing to place yourself at a disadvantage? The hardest one, usually the hardest situation is, let's say you were enabling a selfish spouse and you were trying your best and then you awakened too late to the damage. And so obviously you sacrificed for years and years and now adding insult to injury, but you still have to do it. So make them whole to the best, to the extent that you can. After that, it is the responsibility of the injured party to forgive. That is different than choosing to remain in an ongoing relationship with the person who hurt you. So again, difference between forgiveness and intimacy. So intimacy is up to each person. We don't owe a person intimacy. But the injured party must ensure that they do not become a perpetrator or an oppressor in their own right, as that would evidence a lack of forgiveness, which would usually speak of them having allowed their anger to morph into resentment than bitterness. And bitterness gives the devil a foothold, and the end of that person becomes a very different and separate matter from the original wrong or hurt they experienced. They have then, if they allow things to morph into bitterness, they have of their own accord, through the choice to become bitter, allowed themselves to morph into an oppressor. Biblical accounts of dads who had kids that went astray. First was God himself. He had Adam and Eve. So even if you're a perfect parent, guess what? How about the father of, and the story of the prodigal son? He had one son who took him for granted, took everything he had, but he had another kid who externally obeyed, but on the inside, what? To the same father, right? the father maintained a consistent disposition, but this kid, it was really evidence of, or it was uh, synonymous with the scribes and Pharisees, this kid maintained a religious um, posture, so to speak. But he had acid in his soul. He allowed jealousy. He allowed resentment. How about Jacob? Jacob had 10, I'm sorry, 12 sons and 10 of those. So 10 out of 12 who damaged his life irreparably, stole years from him by lying about uh, Joseph, 27 years, by the way, and maintained a horrific lie that changed the course of the family forever. His oldest son, Reuben, damaged his relationship 
But Reuben had damaged his relationship with Jacob, his dad, by screwing him over by having sex with his uh, stepmother. Jacob's two other sons, Simeon and Levi, hated their half-brother so much because of their jealousy that they planned to murder him. One of the son, Judah, then intervened and said, but you know what, let's make a profit off him instead. So there's four out of, out of, um, four out of ten. And all six of the older half-brothers half went along with their older brothers, so all ten of them maintained the most horrific of lies for 27 years. And they would have continued and allowed their dad to take that lie to the grave, meaning to believe a lie, to the grave, unless God had intervened and forced them to be honest. Aaron, remember Moses and Aaron, they were brothers. Aaron had four boys, two of whom, Nadab and Abihu, acted so brazenly and psychopathically, quite frank, or sociopathically, that God killed them and told Aaron not to mourn for them. How about Eli the high priest? He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who grew wicked because their father never checked their selfishness and attitude, and eventually that turned into their self-entitlement and narcissism. How about Solomon? So you have uh, David's son Solomon. Remember King Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon, the book of Proverbs. He had his son Rehoboam, who ruined everything his dad had built due to his secret disrespect for his dad and caused civil war among Israel, and then you have the divided kingdom. And then there's David. David had a son who allowed his anger to fester, and David blew it. Granted, David blew it. He didn't reconcile with his son. He kept stringing his son along, not trying to make amends, not trying to reconcile, and his son became angry. And that anger was allowed to fester to the point that he calculated his son did. Son named Absalom. He, ca he uh, let it fester to the point that he calculated Absalom did how he was going to harm his father in the most outrageous and public way, ensuring that his father, uh, ensuring that his father knew that things were beyond the point of reconciliation. We talked about that last time. He created a coup. That was Absalom. And what is God's commentary on Absalom? It's not, David, you blew it. No. Here is the degree of uh, possible uh, degrees off the straight and narrow. There are a number of categories of kids that we can have. Let me show you where the prodigal son is. The prodigal son, look at how God feels about the prodigal son. And so that's how we should feel as well. So the prodigal son is the prodigal because he never crossed people's boundaries per se, and he acted he acted immorally but not unethically. That's important. He never stole from anybody. So the father and God the father has um, love towards that kid. So you can see how he became ignorant. He was simple and wayward. So he was inviting issues. What is the next category? And let's find out how God feels about this next category. It is the rebel. Well, who's the rebel? It is the one, if you go straight down, that is deciding to override conscience. They are becoming obstinate. They're becoming stubborn and then obstinate and resistant. That is Nadab and Abihu. If you have a child like that, then Unfortunately, it's starting to get worse, and they will now, by degree, uh, start to cause problems, and they will mock, right? They will do things in a willful fashion, and our response, we're going to have to start to have boundaries. Well, how are they going to respond? Mocking. Let me show a third category of potential adult children that we could end up having, regardless of what kind of dad, if we have tried to make amends, okay? We have then they morph into the mocker. What is the uh, primary characteristic of a mocker? This is someone who has the beginning of disdain. They will take your values and they will toss them in your face and they will sneer. They'll look at you and you don't even recognize them anymore. You notice that this has nothing to do with, well, you know, because dad wasn't perfect. No. Everyone has a choice where they're going to go on this chart. 
the more you harden your heart and violate your conscience, you move from blue to red. The next category will eventually become the spiteful. What is a spiteful child going to do? Well, you can see some of that stuff. They're going to be not only indifferent, but they're going to be callous. They're going to despise authority. If you go straight down, you can see some of their defiant, they're perverse. So you're going to start to see in their lifestyle, in their language, but in their lifestyle, their choices, their friends, right? They're going to jettison what you have tried to teach them, and they are going to do stuff to try to hurt you. If a kid continues to go down, and we're eventually getting to um, Absalom, quite frankly, okay? But these are, the spiteful would be uh, Jacob's 10 sons by degree, um, and they were bordering on apostate. This is uh, Romans chapter three. If you have a child, and this is right out of the book of he Hebrews, where what can you do if a someone has seen as much truth, has been provided as much information about the truth, and they reject it? Sadly, you may be looking at a child that if you go straight down, and by the way, look at the top words, his wrath, his vengeance, that's God. And at this point, we need to turn the child over and do not allow, do not have this child in your life. Why? Because they're going to do things that are malicious. If you go straight down, despise authority. There they are, malevolent. They're not only twisted and they're wicked, but they're becoming vile. They're the deceiver and the slanderer. And that is the point of no return. Once a child begins to slander, yeah, that soul murder, he or she is, is going after dad's reputation. And I call that the harmful. That is what happened with Absalom. And once a child gives evidence that they are targeting you, you have to let them go. And I recommend you read Psalm 3 and Psalm 4. Psalm 3 is David, David's words about his son. It is heartbreaking. But if you have a child that despite doing the best you can, despite uh, if there were amends needed, but it doesn't seem like, and especially if it was sudden, can you have a kid that suddenly uh, changes within a few years or a brief period of time, especially if you set boundaries, especially if you hold them accountable? Let's say they, you co-sign them alone and they say, yeah, I, I've researched this. It, it's better for me. And now your credit score goes from 850 to 550. What happens? You have to draw boundaries. And if they double down and now you're the enemy, you may have an Absalom on your hands. Spend time in Psalm 3 and Psalm 4, and even more of the Psalms, but especially those two, and then turn them over and take heart that the Lord knows. And go back through pictures then. If you start to doubt and waver, like, what kind of dad was I then? Look at my kids. Go back through some of the pictures, some of the letters, some of the emails, some of the texts, because those don't lie. We'll be back to continue looking at forgiveness, what it is versus what it is not, on the next edition of Journey to Healing. You've been listening to Journey to Healing, sponsored by SurvivorSupport.net. We trust you've been helped by the information our host, John Euler, has shared. To donate to this ministry, to schedule a personal consultation with John, or to arrange a professional training for your church or organization with John, simply visit our website. On behalf of Survivor Support, we look forward to hearing from you and to have you join us next time on Journey to Healing. <laughs>